Atheist Nomads, episode 126, news for December 24, 2015. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey, how's it going? Hey, did you know that Ishmael's black? Yes, I did. All right. That's a throwback to last show. Go listen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, Lauren will hopefully be joining us later. Uh, we will We will see uh, if she ends up being able to join us for science. Mm-hmm. Uh, which may even just be me and her recording yeah, totally right before I, I edit. Yep. Yeah. Since we're recording mm-hmm. this on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. A little bit of uh, behind the scenes for our listeners. <laughs> we re- usually record <laughs> Tuesday, I edit Wednesday, and then we release Thursday. But uh, yeah, do you have any uh, holiday plans, Wesley? Oh, um, yeah, no, not really. Uh, me, Sam, Meredith, and Becky and might all go to a Life of Brian showing it on to christmas i think but that's oh, nice. really about it <laughs> nice yeah we've got friends coming over for uh christmas eve yeah we're gonna have uh chili and oyster chowder which is traditional for lauren's family to have both uh, uh, white or red chowder white okay good it's from her dad's uh scandinavian roots red chowder's the devil <laughs> and nasty. then the chili will be red Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Should be. Yeah, and then uh, Christmas Day, Lauren's sister will be coming over for dinner, and we've got a seven-pound ham Holy for shit. that. And uh, then uh, day after, we'll be going to see Star Wars. Nice. Okay, so I won't I won't spoiler, but JJ did it fucking awesome. He did it proud. Oh, all right. I was very happy. Nice. All right, so holidays are a a big thing. And you're like, right now, we're we're at, you know, in the deep into the holiday season. And this particular part of it is centered around uh, the the winter solstice. If you look at history, you had, you know, say, first couple centuries of the Common Era and before, you had Roman Saturnalia, which would last almost two weeks. You would have Mithra uh, dying and rising on the solstice, which was then December 25. And Mithra was a sun god. Horus did the same down in Egypt. Mithra was a uh, Persian and Roman army. Uh, hmm. Sun god represented by a bull. And Christmas ended up popping up because you had all these saint days gaining in popularity, but there wasn't anything just for Jesus except for Easter. And they were like, no, this isn't right. So even though he's got like a whole passion week in the Catholic calendar, <laughs> they decided to add Christmas, and there was also just the whole factor they were starting to try to convert the uh, the German tribes that had their Yule celebration with evergreen trees at the same time, and the Romans with Saturnalia, and also a lot of people from Mithraism who would have been celebrating a dying and rising god. And they're like, okay, we will take this holiday that in many cases is set to a dying and rising sun god, and we'll just make it our dying and rising god. So- and Christmas was born. So basically, it's easier to uh, tell all those people that they can still celebrate their holiday, but just know that it's actually Jesus's birthday and all those other ones are fake. Yep. Which, like I learned in in Mexico, since Lauren and I, you know, two weeks ago, we're down in in Mexico. We uh, learned that there is actually a connection between Our Lady of Guadalupe and the like Aztec mother of the gods. Nice. Kind of got linked a bit. And we will be talking more about that in a future episode. Cool. Uh, but so with these holidays, what would, what, you know, you had the, the syncretism. That was something that the Catholic Church has always been really good at. You enter an area and you look around and you see what you can Christianize. Co-opt it. If you fast forward uh, quite a bit, the Protestant Reformation started a process of de-Catholicizing Christianity, which what they really viewed was, you know, the combination of the traditions that formed and pagan influences that got tied in. So certain practices that weren't viewed as truly Christian, like asceticism, 
uh, you know, self-flagellation and the like. Um, that came in from Gnosticism. So that was gone. One of the things that was on the, the uh, chopping block in more of the more radical parts of the Reformation was getting rid of pagan holidays that had Christian names. <laughs> that included Christmas, which if you look at all the traditional Chris- Christmas stuff, only the nativity is actually Christian. If they uh, got rid of Easter because its very name, Estar, was a fertility god. And it was a celebration of fertility at the time of the uh, spring equinox. And they started getting the holidays. In Massachusetts in the colonial days, the Puritans actually banned the celebration of Christmas. Nice. Christmas as we know it didn't come around until the 19th century. But in this, this era of, or that, in that era of Protestant rejection of anything viewed as Catholic, um, the Adventists did a lot of ripping out Catholic stuff, including changing the day of the week they worshiped on. <laughs> uh, the Catholic Church is proud that they changed the day of worship to Sunday. Adventists are proud that they changed it back to Saturday. <laughs> they also got rid of eating pork and shellfish, which is something that they say was a Catholic addition. But Christmas, Easter, those two holidays in particular, uh, they were out. And what was interesting was for me, I got to grow up as those holidays were starting to be embraced by the church. Really? It was a very interesting process to observe. Going from Christmas being, you know, like the, the Sabbath around Christmas being uh, the most poorly attended and barely a service at all to <laughs> actually starting to get to have uh, Christmas plays and Christmas-themed sermons. Easter, I... Remember when Easter wasn't mentioned at all in church. And by the time I was in college, um, it was very common for Adventist pastors to do Easter sermons. Wow. And so one thing that's kind of interesting for me is those holidays were secular in nature for me. Christmas was a secular holiday in my family. Uh, the, the religious elements in it were was something I actually brought in. And uh, what's also interesting along with those those trends like adopting of holidays because most protestants non-mainline protestants uh had rejected those holidays throughout much of the you know 16th through 19th centuries and it was a really a late 20th century thing to start bringing those back in there's still a few that hold out like jehovah's witnesses they do not celebrate holidays or even they won't birthdays. give gifts but they'll take them <laughs> <laughs> We'll take a quick break, and then we'll be back with this day in history. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. This day in history, December 24th, starting in the year 1294, uh, Pope Boniface the Eighth is elected, replacing St. Celest- uh, Celestine V, who had resigned. Uh, so, yeah, just, just know that. The story is about Boniface, but I'm going to speak more about Celestine any, just because he's more interesting. Um, so yeah, anyways, uh, Boniface is known uh, really well for like being, he really, he like uh, organized the first uh, Roman Catholic Jubilee uh, year to take place in Rome. And uh, one of the really big things that he did was uh, kind of declare and kind of bring together both spiritual and temporal power uh, under the Pope's jurisdiction. And uh, he also kind of put the smackdown on the the kings, which uh, were now to be subordinate to the power of the Roman pontiff. Today, he's probably best known for his uh, feuds with uh, King Philip the Fourth of France, and uh, Dante. Uh, Dante actually put that pope in the eighth circle of hell in his Divine Comedy. <laughs> Man. Well, and one thing that's kind of interesting with all of that is the uh, earlier popes had been very concerned about. Christian princes fighting against each other, hmm. which is what was one of the big factors in launching the first crusade. 
Well, by the time Boniface was in office, the Crusades were pretty much done, and they had to do something to try to keep all these Christians from fighting each other. Muslims were kind of on the retreat in the Iberian Peninsula, but they were making major inroads in uh, Eastern Europe. Hmm. Well, so like I was saying, I wanted to touch back on uh, Celestine also. Uh, so when he got made Pope, uh, he had basically no political political experience, and he was especially weak and well, really incompetent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he actually kept his, his office in the Kingdom of Naples, uh, which was totally out of contact with the uh, Roman Curia, and uh, well, was under the complete power of King Charles II. So <laughs> it's kind of kind of sad, but uh, anyways, wow. yeah, he was he was fairly old when when he got elected, and uh, this is this is actually a really interesting tidbit. Uh, he um, he was elected pope in the Catholic Church's last non conclave pa uh, papal election ending a two-year impasse. So there hadn't been a, a pope for like two years before Celestine got elected. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Celestine is, I would say, most known for um, basically getting it so that he could resign. Uh, let's see. Let me read this from, from the article. Among the only surviving edicts he issued was the confirmation of the right of the pope to abdicate. Nearly all of his other official acts were annulled by his successor, uh, Boniface. A week after issuing the decree, Celestine resigned, stating his desire to return to his humble pre-papal life. And on uh, December 13th, uh, 1294, Celestine announced his resignation. And uh, yeah, he was uh, imprisoned very soon after by Boniface in the castle of Fumane in the uh, Campana. Campana. Mm. Wow. So yeah, he died like 10 months later at the age of 81 and you know, point of interest. Um, that is how, uh, Pope Benedict got out of the church. Well, a couple years ago mm -hmm. is using this thing that has been done before people. Popes have been, have resigned like two or three other ones, but, uh, under this edict that, uh, Celestine made, there's only been well, him and Benedict and Gregory the 12th. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. He uh, abdicated uh, during the Council of Constance, what? which had been called by his opponent, who was an anti, and that ended the Western Schism. I mean, there was a Pope in Pontian. Okay, maybe there was. Shut up, my bad. Hmm. Uh, but what's what's interesting is, uh, yeah. You know, so the next time they use the conclave, which is where you lock all of the electors into a room and you don't let them out until they elect a pope. Hmm. That's yeah, the yeah, current they, system. <laughs> yeah, they actually like chain the door closed and they, they're in there until they pick them. Yep, and then when the smoke color changes, then they will unlock the doors and let them make the announcement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's weird. better than taking two years. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. That, that was pretty sad, yeah. <laughs> All right, so moving on along. Here's a shorty but a goodie. This is near... This year in history, 1826, the Eggnog Riot, um, also known as the, I love this name, the Grog Mutiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, this was a riot that took place at the United States Military Academy in fucking West Point. Yeah. Um, so on the 24th, 25th of December, 1826. Yeah. Great. Uh, it was caused by a drunken Christmas day party, uh, in the North barracks of the Academy. Two days prior to the incident, a large quantity of whiskey was smuggled into the Academy to make you know, said eggnog. And, uh, yeah, the riot eventually involved more than one third of the cadets at the time. And it finally ceased on uh, Christmas morning. Uh, during the investigation that happened later, uh, the academy officials um, actually implicated 70 cadets, court-martialing 20 of them, and one enlisted soldier. Uh, interesting side bit. Uh, one of the participants in the riot, uh, though he wasn't court-martialed, was a future Confederate States President, Jefferson Davis. <laughs> Very nice. I, I just find that just... Oh, boy. Yeah, well, eggnog was the, the traditional American drink. 
started in the early colonial days with rum coming up from the Caribbean and them milking a cow directly into a bucket of rum. <laughs> nice. Nice. Oh, no, it's a little too strong. Give it a couple more squirts. <laughs> this day in history, 1865, the Ku Klux Klan is formed. And that's really all I'm saying about that. <laughs> they don't deserve. They were, okay, realistically, what they were mm. was, at that time, was an insurgency group. They used terrorism to fight reconstruction. I would say, well, they they have like three different segments, chunks mm-hmm. of, of time right. that they that they really got involved in. Yet, I'd say at every time they were kind of like that. The, the original clan, though, ended when Reconstruction ended and Union forces were pulled out of the South. Mm. They won. Mm. The the clan won <laughs> yeah. and dissolved. Uh, one of their interesting successes in their second iteration was getting private schools banned in Oregon in the 1920s as an anti-Catholic measure. Yeah. Well, it's what, back in the days when they were still on the Democratic side, wasn't it? Yes. And, <laughs> Which they yeah. still were by their third, beginning of their third iteration in the uh, like 1960s. But we will be hearing more about the Klan later. Oh, like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so this day in history, 1913, the Italian Hall disaster, or also sometimes referred to as the 1913 massacre. Yeah, uh, so this is a tragedy that, of course, happened on December 24th, 1913, in a small town called Calumet, Michigan. 73 men, women, and children, mostly striking uh, mine workers and their families, were crushed to death in a stampede when someone falsely shouted fire during a crowded Christmas party. Yeah, so they went to this town hall uh, building. A uh, place that they went to is actually up on the second floor, and there was a very steep set of stairs, very steep, very narrow set of stairs to get up to this area. Uh, there was over 400 people up there, and uh, yeah, they were definitely trying to organize a, a strike at the time. They were going to strike. Uh, at this copper mine and there's a lot of speculation as to whether or not it was like a mine supporter of a mine a uh, like a management person from the from the mine might have shouted fire and you know started all this and people started bolting for the exit and started falling and trampling over wow you know, there were there was like a, a fire escape out the back windows but i guess nobody knew about it and I guess nobody really checked to see if there was actually a fucking fire because a uh, fire department at the time said that there was no evidence of any fire anywhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, 59 children. That's quite the quite the bit there. Mm-mm. And today it is illegal to yell fire in a theater. <laughs> yeah, for things just like this. Yeah. Yeah, so you're... Your uh, ability to speak speak freely is slightly limited because of mm-hmm. events like this. Yep, <laughs> rightly so. Because yeah, pranks can end deadly. Fucking a. And then they're not funny. Well, maybe a little bit. All right. So this day in history, the year is nineteen fourteen. The Christmas truce happened. So this is actually a bit of a misnomer. First of all, um, before I even get into it, um, <laughs> this. this <laughs> This had actually been happening like for a month or two before this actual date occurred. Anyways, okay, going on along. Um, so the Christmas truce was a series of widespread but unofficial ceasefires along the Western Front around uh, Christmas 1914. Um, in the week leading up to the holiday, German and British soldiers crossed trenches to exchange seasonal greetings and talk. In some areas, men from both sides ventured into no man's land on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day to mingle, exchange food, souvenirs. There were some joint burial ceremonies and prisoner swamps. Well, uh, several meetings ended in Christmas carol singing. Supposedly there was even like a, a game or two of football played with one another. Odd, but actually kind of true. Mm-hmm. You know, however, the peaceful behavior was definitely not ubiquitous. Uh, fighting continued in some sectors, 
while in others, you know, the side settled on little more than just agreeing to go out and get their debt. So, yeah, that's kind of odd, but uh, there is a, a lot of trench warfare, and this is pretty much where this happened exclusively was in, you know, areas with lots of trenches on both sides. And, you know, the trenches in, in a lot of places were so close that you could actually hear people talking in, in from one trench trench to the other. And, <laughs> you know, they actually got to be kind of friendly in some places. So, yeah, odd, but kind of true. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, this actually happened in some other places, and not just in this war. Uh, apparently, there was a couple reports of this happening dur- during World War II also. Hmm. But, yeah, odd, but there you go. Yeah. So Definitely not as widespread as commonly believed. Yeah, no, no. It's definitely quite localized into a few areas, but enough that it was, you know, about on both sides. And- mm-hmm. It's celebrated. Yeah. Thought it was a high point in the war. Oh, there's been movies made about it. Uh, In 1915, there was lots of, lots of uh, superiors that were saying, don't you fucking go out then. (laughs) But, you know, there was still a couple small places had little truces and little get togethers. And uh, by 1916, though, this shit was basically done because there was just so many dead on both sides that, that you know people were just like fuck it you know there's just too many hurt feelings and you know bad blood between both sides so yeah pretty much didn't happen again during world war one very cool yeah so that's what i got all right we will take a quick break and be back with science we love hearing from our listeners you can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com tweet us at atheistnomads send us a message on our facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. Wesley won't be joining us for this segment, but we are now joined by my lovely wife, Lauren Studley. Hello, everyone. I am not sick anymore. Well, I am, but not, like, crying. Yay! Yay! Although I did get a, a Mystery Science Theater 3000 movie in while I was queen on the couch, so that's good. Good for you. Anyway, science! Merry science to you all. Since uh, science news has been a little slow this past uh, couple weeks, I decided to do just a general roundup of awesome stuff that happened this year, because it's the end of the year. Yeah, you know, I've, I've noticed this happening uh, the last several years as well. It seems like... Holidays, you got schools on on break, and nobody releases anything. Well, scientists have holidays too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I noticed was a big uh, themes this year involved uh, science ex- or space exploration, um, and climate change. Yeah, there's a lot of that out there. That's really depressing, though, since half our of our uh, nation decides to ignore it. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and focus on. The stars above and what we have seen this year. You all may have re- uh, remember recently that water was discovered on Mars. Yes. Nice. Not exactly, but close enough, right? So what they notice is that uh, on the year-to-year scans of Mars, that there are these dark streaks that would appear and then disappear with the seasons. That kind of lends uh, to the belief that perhaps there is some hydration stuff going on there and that they needed to further investigate it. Well, okay, for everybody out there, uh, if you hear some barking in the background, uh, Bucky's in timeout, so he's not too happy about it. (laughs) Anyway, back to the darkening streaks on Mars. Uh, What happened was, uh, what they did was they uh, had a spectrometer measure the, the streaks, and it revealed that there was salt... Which, you know, there's going to be salt, but that this salt showed evidence of hydration. Wow. I.e. salt water. So they've been destri- describing it as briny streaks on Mars. It's proof that there is some kind of water coming up from under the ground, hydrating the salt, and then it disappears again as the seasons go by. Um, and just for those of you who don't know, a spectrometer, um, you hear it a lot, especially in like Star Trek and The Martian and just about everything. Um, a spectrometer measures light and splits it into different wavelengths, um, 
which like a prism, you know, you can measure color and, 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 and actually measure it, measure the wavelengths in like millimeters and stuff. It's pretty cool. And every chemical element has a distinctive signature or pattern when you do this. That's how they figured out that it was salt. And then that's how they figured out that it was also hydrated salt. So hooray for spectrometry. Yeah. Well, and one of the big things they were looking for on Mars was liquid water, since liquid water is absolutely critical for having life. Yes. And this has led to horrible, horrible headlines this year, if anybody has been paying attention to my headline rants, where, um, no, they haven't discovered any kind of rivers or pools or anything like that on Mars. What they discovered basically is remnants of water. And that's pretty much it. But that's enough because they've been seeing the discoloration on the photos as they, you know, go around Mars. Um, There's no pools. There's no rivers. There's nothing like that. It's all underground as far as we can tell. Moving on. Another great thing that happened this year, and I'm sure everybody was freaked out as I was, was uh, the New Horizons space probe did its closest flyby of Pluto. Took lots of cool pictures. Um, Before this particular light uh pluto was this blurry mass that looked kind of odd shaped and we weren't really sure we kind of thought maybe it was a sphere but we weren't we weren't sure we didn't know anything we just saw a blob in space well new horizons flew by took tons of pictures and we are in the process of retrieving those pictures now um and it's going to take a little while uh it took nine years for new horizons to even get there um, and it, that's really fast for going that far. Oh, yeah. It was going like the highest speed that you can get, that we can get with our technology. Um, nine years isn't bad. And considering that the 50 gigabytes of information is being transferred back, it's going to take about 16 months total for all of that information to be retrieved. <laughs> um, as of right now, December, what, 22nd, whatever it is today, 23rd. Um, new photos have just been revealed, I believe, two days ago. So that we're we're in the midst of still getting all of these new photos, and it's really really cool because New Horizons was packed with all sorts of imaging equipment, and um, I decided to do a little rundown of some of the different things that this New well, Horizons had. Before we get to that, one of the things that's really cool with a lot of these missions is they produce way more data than can be analyzed quickly. So this is one where. A few days of collecting data, it's taking months to get it back to us, and it will take years to actually analyze all of it and gather all of the information. Right. It's like getting a new, really complicated toy on Christmas. That first day that you're messing with it, you don't get to really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You're just really excited you have it. And we're kind of in the midst of opening our presents right now. Yeah, and then at a low bandwidth connection with insanely high latency yeah kind of uh <laughs> kind of reminds me of those dial-up days where you saw the the picture kind of develop one strip at a time yeah <laughs> made porn really really anticipatory anyway some of the some of the measuring equipment that was on new horizons had some really cool names and they just kind of caught my eye so i thought i'd go through them real quick um swap i'm not going to go through what all of this stuff means because yeah it'll take forever um swap was a device that measured the stripping of the atmosphere so one of the things that they've recently uh, discussed in some articles is that there is proof that Pluto's entire atmosphere has been stripped away by solar um, solar winds. Pretty cool. Um, they theorized, too, that I believe Mars has been suffering from the exact same thing. Earth has kind of, uh, its atmosphere has produced kind of a shield effect for it, so our atmosphere isn't escaping nearly as much. But Pluto, yeah, basically it's all gone. The stuff that is there is really cool, though. They do have pictures of a comet-like tail um, going by <clears throat> Pluto that shows the re- what is re- left of its atmosphere being stripped away. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, Pepsi, P-E-P-S-S-I. Pepsi is, uh, what it does is it measures the composition and density of escaping ions. No, I have no idea what that actually means, but it sounds really cool because New Horizons has Pepsi. <laughs> so take that Coke. Rex, R E X, like T Rex. Um, probably my favorite named instrument. It's pretty cool. Uh, Rex measures atmospheric conditions and temperature. So, really basic. I mean, half of us have that attached to our house. Thank you, Oregon Science. But, um, 
you know, they had a little one stuck mm-hmm. on there for, for the basics, the temperatures that are super cold. So yeah, this would be a little bit more than just like a, a household barometer and thermometer. I don't know. But... Have you seen the, the Oregon science ones that are like really high tech? They are awesome. This is probably has lasers. I would not doubt that Oregon Science has lasers on some of their top models. Yeah, they have they have yeah. sets for the household that are like $1,000. Like and what on earth could they possibly have on that ding? And for a household model, you could have a much more powerful laser than on a little spacecraft. Yeah, awesome. That is so far from the sun. All right. Well, if Oregon Science doesn't have that and they're listening, lasers, guys. <laughs> we want lasers. And sponsorship. And sponsorship. <laughs> uh, yeah, because we're cheap and all we have is a stupid battery-powered thermometer stuck to our window. Um, the next it one. It was ten degrees too warm today. Well, yeah. The next one is named Alice. Yeah, that's cute. Probably named after somebody's daughter or wife or something. Um, Alice is the ultraviolet imaging uh, uh, device for the atmosphere. So ultraviolet, we start to get one part of the spectrum, and it is paired with Ralph who I don't know who Ralph is, but Ralph and Alice basically give us a huge range of, um, of imaging. So Alice is ultraviolet. Ralph is infrared and visible. Okay. And with those two things, you're able to see things that the, just the naked eye can't see. That birds and alpine fish can't even see. And mantis shrimp. Well, maybe mantis shrimp. See, we don't know. Those things are. Lori, L-O-R-R-I, is the long range imager. So that is, when we're seeing the high resolution pictures coming through, Lori is the one that took, um, this is super high resolution. They are finding what was previously thought to be smooth ground to be dotted with mysterious pits. And we're seeing mountains that are one and a half miles tall uh, with incredible detail, all thanks to uh, Venetia. Venetia's probably... Uh, next to Rex, one of my favorites. Venetia is actually a student-made experiment that went on New Horizons that is constantly measuring space dust. That's <laughs> all it does, is, is measuring space dust as this New Horizon probe goes through the solar system. That is awesome. And, you know, pretty ingenious when you think about it. When you We, we don't know how to travel through our solar system at all. One of the things that we're going to have to know is how much space dust is where. Mm-hmm. And this is our first little, you know, we threw a dart out and we're measuring. And that's our first little scoop oh. on that. Yeah. Student yeah. designed. Nice. So I'm pretty jealous of all the students nine years ago who got this approved. That's pretty cool. Um, like I said, it'll take about 16 months total from that uh, July date to, to get all the imaging and all the data. And then, like Dustin said, it is going to take years and possibly some citizen science projects to dig mm-hmm. through all that data. We're talking like zero one zero zeros, and it's going to be it's going to be crazy. But I'm really excited to see what comes of it. And kind of brought Pluto back into the spotlight after it was stripped of its crown. Very nice, like, like Miss Columbia. Oh, and I made a a <laughs> stupid statement about it using it, its power levels available having anything to do with the sun. It has a 200 watt nuclear power plant. Yeah, the plutonium. Pluto. Plutonium. Oh, <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, way to go. Plutonium is actually um, what's giving it power, and it's more than enough for mm-hmm. what New Horizons. So it's not going to suffer from a decrease in power when it exits the system. This is the same kind of power plant that Voyager has. Yeah, and um, I believe it's the one that got the astronauts to the moon for the first uh, time. On the moon. On the moon. Got them. Is what they're using on the on moon. The moon. Yeah. Well, and my last little article, well, one of them. Yeah. My last little article for today is going to be about Rosetta. You guys all remember Rosetta. That was so cool. If anybody had the live stream up watching that thing crash land into the comet, it was super awesome, super nerdy, and, you know, cred to anybody who actually sat through that. But watching the scientists was made it all worth it. Mm -hmm. Um. Basically, what happened is in November of 2014, the Rosetta spacecraft released its landing probe, known as Philae, began its descent as planned. But when it hit the comet, one of its little harpoons didn't eject and didn't spear into the rock. So it bounced. It bounced a really <laughs> long way. This poor little thing, it bounced twice, but in the process of that, landed half a mile away from where it started. 
So, you know, not much gravity out there. You can imagine the uh, anticipation of these scientists as that thing just crash landed and then they got like nothing and then waited for some data to come in as it bounced around this comet. At a half a mile doesn't seem like much, but on a comet, that's huge. Yeah, Comets it, aren't big. <laughs> yeah, it it pretty much spanned the entire head of the this bulbous <laughs> comet. So it, it went for a ride. Unfortunately, that means it also landed a half a mile away from where it was supposed to land, where it was going to get plenty of sunlight. Instead, of course, thank you Murphy's Law, it landed in a shadow. So it sent a few pictures, and then it died. Now, it didn't die permanently. It went to hibernation. And it was just in uh, this year, in July, that sun finally reached it. It powered up its systems, and it started sending more information. So this year was really cool for that. Um, they sent back uh, some wonderful what they call selfies. Because if any of you remember, the comet looks kind of like a rubber duck. So it's sending back selfies because the thing landed on its head. <laughs> mm. So we're getting rubber duck comet selfies and uh, some more information about the composition of the comet. Um, the black and white photos are eerie as all get out. And I highly suggest you go check them out. They're really cool. Um, so that kind of wraps it up for some of the big things that happened in space this year. Yeah. Of course, stuff is happening all the time. So if you subscribe to maybe space.com's um, RSS feed or uh, even just NASA's, you can hook up with all sorts of stuff. Um, I, I was just scrolling through and some of the other things that happened this year included some amazing pictures of Saturn's moons, Enceladus, mm. and Mimas. Now, Mimas is awesome because from the distance, it looks like the F and Death Star. Okay? <laughs> it's got a crater on the side. So that's not a moon. Yes, it is. It's Mimas. So, yeah, go look at pictures of Mimas. Um, another thing, kind of Star Wars-y, too, is that they just released photos of an amazing nebula that has what they're calling the double-bladed lightsaber. It basically looks like just a streak right through the middle of this nebula. But, yeah, okay, I can totally see it. It looks like the double-sided li uh, lightsaber. Oh, nice. Yeah, they're total geeks down there. You know it. Oh, yeah. Um, another thing, too, is that we've been getting amazing photos of Earth... Um, they seen getting the full face of Earth in the sunlight thanks to an instrument called Epic. So if you mm -hmm. want to get some real Epic photos, uh, go check out Epic's um, gallery that just released a new new picture of Africa. That is amazing. You can see the detail is just amazing. The clouds mm. are distracting enough, but seeing like the deserts and the tropical forests and stuff in that wow. kind of detail is really amazing. I kept a picture of the uh, North American one because the Bahamas were just this like turquoise blue. And it was amazing looking from Epic. Mm. Pretty epic. You know, it's also worth noting that uh, some advancements have been made for upcoming manned space flight. Uh, granted, this is just for orbital and suborbital stuff, but both Jeff Bezos' company and SpaceX have successfully landed rockets. Yeah, it took a couple of tries, and there were some disasters involved, including, unfortunately, a loss of a rocket that um, was carrying a whole lot of stuff mm -hmm. for the International Space Station. It's like, oops, sorry, guys, you're going to have to get your supplies in another nine months or something. But, but yeah. Yeah, they landed. Being able to land and reuse a rocket, that's that's new. Yeah, that's new. That's and exciting. That's cool. And that is something that's um, they're going to get. It's going to pick up. And here in a couple of years, we knows where we'll be. And it will save so much money. Yay. You won't get to reuse them all that many times, but still, getting to reuse them, you can cut down on cost. And that's one of the big points of doing commercial space operations. Yeah. That, and we want to be able to get people other than Justin Timberlake up in these. Yeah. All right. So that's it for science. All right. We will be back after a quick break. Uh, Lauren will be gone, but Wesley will be back with us. As a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine and Red Bull. We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at AtheistNomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. It's now time for politics and religion. And first off, we've got a story from the FDA. 
They have now announced that the permanent deferral against men who have had sex with another man even one time since 1977, keeping them from donating blood or blood products that has been in place since 1985, is no longer supported by the evidence. So now there will only be a 12-month deferral for man-on-man action. (laughs) What this (laughs) means... Yeah. So what this means is that they still consider gay sex to be high risk. They just now consider it to be an event, not a behavior. Now, I do have some background experience in in blood and blood products. So I, I know how those deferrals are categorized. If it's thought of as a behavior, which... Man-on-man sex was considered a behavior. IV drug use is another thing that has been considered a behavior. Uh, being, a, being a prostitute is considered a behavior, while visiting a prostitute is considered an event. Now, men having sex with men is considered a event. Uh, <laughs> what sucks is IV drug users, regardless of how many times or when they last shot up, are still permanently deferred. I have one friend who shot up one time at 15. She's in her 30s now and can't donate blood because of one time. Kind of ridiculous. At 15? Yeah. Permanent deferrals for disease risk are never justifiable since high-risk behavior is a series of events. And if the last high-risk event was prior to the furthest extent of the testing window, then there is no risk from that event. That's what testing is for. These deferrals all went in place before there was testing. They stayed in place when they observed that adding these deferrals had reduced the rate of transmission of illness to uh, patients receiving the end product. And then they validated it by doing testing on samples they had taken from some of these uh, people that have been identified as high risk. But we have testing now. So that's, that's crazy to continue just doing blanket deferrals. The 12-month deferral, the window they're going with, which is a very common one across blood and blood products, is also bullshit on the grounds it is three times the length of the longest testing window, which is four months for hepatitis C. If uh, tattoos only get six months. It, it varies. Mm. Uh, deferrals are going to vary from firm to firm. Uh, across the board because they have to, you know, just because the FDA says this isn't required anymore to do lifetime deferrals, uh, they still have to update their standard operating procedures, create new questionnaires. And in some cases, if they're involved in export to foreign countries, they have to also comply with that foreign country's deferral criteria. So plasma donation will probably not be affected by this because as far as I'm aware, there's only two other countries that have gone to less than a lifetime deferral for men who have sex with men. Hmm. Uh, But finally, uh, blanket deferrals are bullshit since what makes, at least in this case, what makes gay sex statistically riskier is bottoming during unprotected anal sex with a variety of sex partners from a pool of people who are statistically more likely than the general population to have HIV, i.e. gay men. This does not apply to all gay men. Not all gay men have anal sex, and oral is orders of magnitude safer. Gay men who always wear condoms or make their partners wear condoms, and they use them correctly, reduce their risk drastically. Gay men who are on Truvada are at virtually no risk of contracting HIV. Oh yeah, and also, not all gay men are promiscuous. And a monogamous couple where both have been tested and found clean are at zero risk of contracting HIV. But asking that many questions to find out if someone is actually high risk, well, that just might be too icky for some people doing the screening at blood banks and plasma centers. And that's really what this comes down to. It's icky. (laughs) It's icky and there's science that can justify it. God damn. So moving along. All right. Larisha Hawkins, an associate professor of political science at Wheaton College, has been suspended from her job over a Facebook post in which she said that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. This is despite the fact that they are both Abrahamic faiths, monotheistic, that the Quran talks about Jesus more than the Bible, (laughs) and that Yahweh, God with the capital G, and Allah are all names for the God of the biblical and Quranic character 
of Abraham or Ibrahim, depending on which book you're looking at. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're all different. Come uh, on. Apparently, according to Wheaton College's statement of faith, uh, they are, <laughs> which I would be surprised if they actually specify in their statement of faith that we worship the Christian God and that is not the Jew God or the, the Mahometan God or whatever outdated language I'm sure they would use. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm sure they'll say Mahatmans. Um, seriously, I mean, can they even say that they worship a different God than the Jews? That's a much hard, would be a much harder argument to make, but it's actually, no, it's not even a harder argument to make because it's the same fucking God. The religions are related. Christianity was based on Judaism. Islam is based on Cree is based on Christianity and Judaism. They are all related. (laughs) That'd be like somebody saying that their nephew can't call their parents grandma and grandpa. (laughs) No, you're a fucking asshole if you think that. But Wheaton College is doing a good job of getting into the news for being fucking assholes. I didn't know that Wheaton was a uh, relig- religious college. Mm-hmm. Huh. They're the ones that are. They're the ones that decided to stop offering health insurance to students because they might have to provide insurance that covers contraceptives. Oh right. Oh goodness. Okay. So that's those assholes. Okay. I see. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Since the, the Paris and San Bernardino attacks, and we didn't get to talk about the latter one because it happened when we had a pre-recorded episode, um, so that kind of sucks. But uh, anti-Muslim sentiments have been incredibly high across our country. All you have to do is look at the Republican presidential candidates, and you can see how batshit insane people are, are being about this. Yes, there are terrible, horrible, scary Muslim extremists. That is not most Muslims. And using such polarizing rhetoric will only serve to radicalize Muslims in America and make it more likely to have radical Muslim extremists. (laughs) Now, of course, Muslims could be doing a better job of distancing themselves from the extremists than they are doing. But, well, we've got what's looking like is going to be a pretty nasty feedback cycle. Uh, for for an example of some of this uh, anti-Muslim sentiments going a bit too far, on December 6, four days after San Bernardino, Denise Slatter, a California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation officer, saw three Muslim men playing volleyball and praying. She started yelling at them, and one of the friends recorded the encounter on his phone. Now let's listen to what she said before she hit the man with the phone and poured coffee on him. And you can hear him getting hit in the head. Now, you will also hear a vehicle that is a park ranger pulling up. You will hear her talking to someone that is the park ranger. So here's the audio. The people you tortured are going to be in eternity in heaven. You are very deceived by Satan. Your mind has been taken over, brainwashed, and you have nothing but hate. Nothing but hate. I'm sorry. Oh. It is inappropriate. You're right. For somebody to tape record me, it is inappropriate. This lady was talking about my God. Get out. She was no, saying he is there. Get out. You're not Excuse me. Excuse me. Stop. 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 Call, call the cop. Please walk away from me. Call the police. Who the fuck talks like that? You crazy woman. Yeah. That is pretty crazy. And this is somebody who worked in a parole office. Right. Well, I hope there were no Muslims uh, on uh, under her. Yeah. She has been suspended and will hopefully be uh, fired before this is all done. Uh, but yeah, you know, she, she, need, she needs a change of scenery. She yelled at them. Weirdly. Weirdly. And okay, who in their right mind isn't going to record something like that? <laughs> and all these men were trying to do was play, uh, pray and play volleyball at a local park. Something yeah. they routinely do. Because, <laughs> I mean, seriously, come on. The, these three guys fucking playing volleyball. And obviously she could tell just by looking at them that those were the people that had tortured Bull. From the article, it sounds like they might have actually been praying at the time that she started. Okay, but. Just by looking at them, she knew these were the Muslims torturing mm-hmm. people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This woman got issues. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just, just going to put that out. There. Yeah. And the, the 
park ranger went to the scene to try to stop it before it escalated further. And yeah, told the woman that she was being inappropriate. Uh, No, no. The inappropriate thing was that somebody was recording her. (laughs) And she called his cell phone a tape recorder. That's crazy. But yeah, so she struck the man with a witness there while he was recording. She dumped her coffee out on him. And she has been charged with misdemeanor battery and a misdemeanor hate crime. Sweet. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So moving along to the other side of the country, Mm. a high school geography lesson in Augusta County, Virginia, has included lessons about the religions of different regions that they are studying for many, many years. And in a lesson about the Middle East, on Friday, December 11, the students were asked to give Arabic calligraphy practice. And this used the Shahada, the Islamic statement of belief that translates as there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Okay. This isn't a typical language to be using for an example of Islam and Arabic text. It is a common thing to see in the Muslim world. Uh, Heck, in my world religions class, I learned it well enough that I actually typed what the Shahada is from memory. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that class would have been 11 years ago. Does so, it read right to left? Yes. Okay. Semitic languages are right to left. Uh, so Superintendent Eric Bond assured people that these students were not asked to translate, recite, or adopt the statement. They just... So they were just copying. They were just copying the text. And I'm betting for most of the students, it was uh, copying squiggles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Serious. Oh, yeah. I, I'm having hard times telling where one starts and one stops. It is difficult. I took a quarter of Arabic at the end of college for my uh, minor in biblical languages. And, oh, man, just getting the script down is so difficult. Those lines are not easy. Not yeah, easy. That's, that's, that's some fucking weird looking calligraphy. Yeah. So parents organized a forum the evening of Tuesday, December 15, about the lesson, calling it indoctrination. Then enough calls and emails came in over the next <laughs> few days that the sheriff advised the superintendent to shut down the school on the 18th. <laughs> the next day, all schools and offices in the district were closed. And the district has promised that next time they'll use a secular text for the Arabic lesson. So the sheriff is telling them they might want to just close everything down because of threats from Christian. Yes. Right. Threats of violence, I'm guessing. Yep. Right. There's that Christian. Yeah. Christian Christian tolerance. I did a Google News search on this today to see if I could find a more recent story on what's happened since. Yeah. And all I'm finding is crazy right wing bullshit that this was a indoctrination attempt that it was the endorsement of of religion that they had left out christianity from their lessons but they were just pushing islam and the quran you know this is a class that talks about christianity and buddhism and hinduism and islam i'm I'm gonna make a i'm gonna go out on a, a ledge here and say that fucking the school in Central Virginia is like the new Detroit or Michigan, and there's like <laughs> fucking areas that you can't even travel if you're Christian. We could get you. Seriously? Come on. What the fuck? Yeah. Oh, and what's crazy with the whole Detroit thing, and we covered that story a while back. Uh, I would be surprised if they have two Muslim families in 50 miles of this school. Oh, probably. Yeah. It's not Dearborn, Michigan. I mean, seriously, come on. Yeah. Uh, how many, how many, they've been doing this for years, apparently. How mm-hmm. many kids, where's the, where's the nearest fucking mosque? How many kids have left to join ISIS? What the fuck? Stupid. Yeah. Oh yeah. Moving on to some anti-Muslimism that uh, was not related to recent attacks. Glendon Scott Crawford approached a KKK Grand Wizard in 2012 to get help with a plan to develop an X-ray weapon. (laughs) Unfortunately for him, the Grand Wizard was an FBI informant. (laughs) Two FBI agents undercover as Klansmen worked with Mr. Crawford 
and provided him the inoperable x-ray device. And specifically what he was asking the Klan for was help getting the device. So sure. FBI agents took care of that. They later recruited Eric Fight, who Crawford worked with at GE, to develop the remote control. And the plan was to produce a remote-controlled mobile X-ray weapon, taking a medical X-ray and somehow diffusing the X-rays so they go out in all directions, as opposed to being very focused, that would silently poison a Muslim terrorist cell, or more likely just a Muslim community, hoping that they would die a few days later. Right. The undercover agents they were working with arrested them in 2013. Fight, uh, fight pled guilty and has been sentenced to eight years in prison for providing material support to terrorists. And this is despite the fact that he never actually provided a working remote control and was really dragging his feet. But he has admitted that he was wrong. Crawford was convicted of attempting to produce a deadly radiological device conspiring to use a weapon of mass destruction and distributing information about weapons of mass destruction. And he will be sentenced in March. <laughs> He's probably going to get 25 years, but it could be life. I thought it was really funny that uh, investigators began tracking Crawford back in 2012 when he approached uh, two groups uh, of uh, Jewish people in the Albany area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he was trying to you know, hit on their hate of Muslims to get this going. Well, there wasn't any detail on what that encounter with the Jews were, because if he had KKK... I'm figuring the Jews turned him down, and then he went to the KKK. That's possible, yeah. yeah that, uh, that, that would put them. That would put him on, on the, the Fed's radar, mm -hmm. which is curious, because so that means that the Jews in the Albany area are on the Fed's radar. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody called the cops... Yeah, possibly. <laughs> or he was being suspicious and they called the cops and <laughs> yeah, something, something crazy going on there. Uh, but what's, what's it? One thing that's kind of interesting here is this is from a 2004 law that was designed to try to protect us from a dirty bomb. So it made it so that, you know, Producing a deadly radiological device was a federal terrorism charge. Uh, well, that's essentially what it would be. This is the it's, first time anybody has ever been charged under that law. I mean, people always talk about uh, like dirty nukes, where you can that. I mean, that's that's where the the scare came from. Mm -hmm. uh, where yeah. you can't you can't properly uh, detonate a, a nuclear device, but you can you know just jack it up and make a really large explosion and just throw nuclear material everywhere and make a lot of people really sick yeah the but, odds of actually killing people would be slim with a, a dirty bomb you're going to kill more people with the, the bomb yeah. than the nuclear material but you're going to make lots and contaminate lots of area maybe mm -hmm. the water who knows yeah <laughs> but the whole scheme seems like something out of a crazy science fiction it's it's pretty fucking janky from start to finish he was basically trying to develop a remote-controlled ray gun. Yeah, yeah, that he wanted to mount in the back of a, a van or something. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so somebody's just gonna, you know, th there's gonna be a plumbing truck out in front of your house for like a week. Nobody's gonna say it if it ever got... I guess the, the moral of the story here is if you see a gray-haired white man driving a van, worry. <laughs> Anyway, uh, conservatives are so concerned about the so-called war on Christmas with such a grievous attacks against the holiday as mm. plain red Starbucks cups and people saying highly offensive slurs like happy holidays. Oh, yeah. But they don't know how good they have it. In the Southeast Asian Muslim-majority kingdom of Brunei, all public celebrations of Christmas have been banned, all to protect against damage to the faith of Muslims. Non-Muslims are allowed private celebrations as long as they notify the authorities in advance. Well, you want them on a list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> this is a country of a very wealthy oil producing country. Really tiny. Yeah. Population of 420,000. 65% or so are Muslim. <laughs> and they have a autocratic sultan who has freckles. Yeah, he's not pure. Oh no. If that's what you're getting at. 
No, he does not look like the uh, the local population. But when you got that much money, fuck it. Be oh, nobody cares. Be. Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, this is not the first time Brunei has made the show, and it will probably not be the last. <laughs> and moving along, Joe Kennedy is back. He is still on paid administrative leave, but with the help of the Liberty Council, he has filed a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission complaining that he has suffered workplace retaliation for exercising his right to religious expression. <laughs> Interestingly, he is specifically claiming that the 50-yard line and locker room prayers with students that he coaches in his job with the school district are private religious expression. Yeah, That's, so that, that complaint that he just filed is basically the last step before actually putting this before a federal court. Yep. That's, that's essentially what this paperwork is for. Oh, yeah, because so, they know that's going to be slapped down by the EEOC. Yeah, definitely. That This is just a, it's just a formality. Yeah, there's, there's good Supreme Court precedents that school district employees cannot be involved with religious activities on campus. That is, he's leading religious activities on campus. Yeah, there's a, a picture here of a whole bunch of, of students and they're, their jerseys praying with him yeah that sounds looks it looks really uh coercive to me it's pretty fucking cut and dry to me yeah but no matter how it turns out the bremerton school district will lose money oh fucking a lots of it um i think it's from 2012 or 2013 like almost 60 percent of our students qualify for free or reduced lunches which is pretty much like the, the the big way that people judge whether a district is poor or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're fucking poor. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah, this this motherfucker. Um we actually have like um TV sets throughout the shipyard where me and Joe work. And I actually noticed uh, on one of the little, you know, the little crossing banner at the bottom of the screen like most TV stations um, and actually said that Joe Kennedy was suing the school district. I was like, huh, this little fucker is actually making the news in the shipyard. Wow. <laughs> yeah, some news uh, reports are saying that he's suing. That he's not suing yet because they have to do this before they can file the lawsuit. Yeah, no, this is total formality. It, it's, it's basically cut and dry. It's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, he's being represented by the Liberty Council down in Texas and a local-ish uh, law firm down in Tacoma, which uh, I've actually looked at their website. It's so fucking janky. They actually have like image tags where like pictures are supposed to be like, all over the website. Mm. I think this, that <laughs> I think they're just so fucking hurting for money. They'll take even a losing <laughs> case like this steaming pile. Oh, you know, the Liberty council is going to be giving them lots of money sure. and the Liberty council is going to be bringing in far lots more than they spend. Money. Oh, fuck. <laughs> That's how they operate. They make more money off of losing cases and winning cases. Yeah. <laughs> the only homeless shelter in Williamsburg, Kentucky, has kicked all women and their children out of the shelter and advised okay. them to go to a women's only shelter that is a 30-minute drive away. Sure. They will, also they, not, they will also not be accepting any women into the shelter or any children unless it is male children with their father. And why? There was just too much sex going on, and since the majority of the residents were men, the easiest way to put a stop to the sexy times was to get rid of the women. Right. Okay, let's kick out the women and the sexy children. Yep. Okay. Women and children first, right? Uh, sure. <laughs> what the f And <laughs> the name of this, this uh, shelter is Emergency Christian Ministries. Yeah, that, that's some really fucking, really fucking Christian act. Awesome. Yeah. What would Jesus do? <laughs> God damn. All right. Well, before we get into the feedback, uh, I, I have finally taken a look at the iTunes reviews. Oh. It has been a while since I have. <laughs> there have been a grand total of five this year. Yes. Rocking it. The most helpful are still from July of 2012. <laughs> uh, let me... Mm -hmm. Read you some of these. I have my I have a, a Hackintosh virtual machine that I have iTunes in. <laughs> nice. So let's see, switching the view to most helpful. The most helpful one. It could be worse. Four stars from July 12, 2012. 
We had been podcasting for two months at that time. This new podcast is a decent addition to my growing feeds. However, I must give it four stars because there's room for improvement. Mm -hmm. It's still early yet. The podcast could easily grow the beard with a few format changes. On the plus side, their show topics are timely and relevant, unlike another podcast that's been rehashing your old stories. Hey, on the plus side, both of us got quite the beards for a Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. This is the most helpful. <laughs> yeah, um... Listeners, you can you can help us out with with that. Mark more recent stuff helpful or downvote old stuff as far Bro, as helpfulness. Fucking rate us on iTunes. Why don't you do that? We have had a gra- <laughs> grand total of thirty two ratings. Yeah, <laughs> that's in three and a half years of podcasting. <laughs> well, to be fair, we don't really pimp that often. We've had twenty two customer reviews. Mm. Uh, the the most recent was from November thirteen of this oh. year just completed listening to episode 119 very brave of all the speakers to relate such personal yet helpful information fuck pretty awesome is that a five star that was a five star from lewis 412 hey there you go thanks lewis uh we did get we did get quite a few in uh january three of the five were in january oh and one of these two star review Ooh. from b and b on the plus side, Wesley and Dustin get great interviews. I often enjoy these and cannot fault them for their caliber of guests. Unfortunately, the show is ruined by its incessant rhetoric and political monoculture. The concept that if you do not cleave to their particular polarized political views is hateful, unhelpful, and ultimately damaging to the secular movement. The times they refer to people of differing political viewpoints as racist and intellectual simpletons are numerous and increasing in frequency. This is unfortunate. It is not uncommon for a podcast in the secular community to possess a political view, nor is it uncommon for this view to be of a particular direction. Wesley and Dustin exemplify what happens when this is taken to an extreme. I used to provide a certain level of monetary support to their podcast, redirected that last fall to another podcast. It isn't that the politics of this new one, or this new podcast, are more in line with my own, but rather they are not the excrement flingers that Atheist Nomads has increasingly become. And they don't refer to me as a racist every single episode. I don't remember re- referring to any of our races. Yeah, I don't know that we've... Yeah, but, definitely not eh. by name. Uh, we honestly <laughs> don't cover racial topics anywhere near enough. Maybe so, he's just saying some of the things that he thinks uh, we don't agree with. And uh, we call those people racist. Now, the only thing that, that comes to mind is... End of last year, beginning of this year, we were covering a lot of stories about progress in the courts for marriage equality and really calling people opposed to that bigots. I definitely call a motherfucker a bigot. I'm wondering if he equated, I'm assuming a he uh, equated uh, bigot with racist. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, that, that, was, a, that was a fun one. <laughs> yeah so please please we could use itunes reviews and it's not just to stroke our egos or anything like that itunes is where the vast majority of podcast listeners are all right so if you if you love us please fucking rate us and give us a little uh you know, write, write us a line or two and you know five stars and you know if you think that we're worth something less than that well please don't write them <laughs> Yeah, four star reviews. Please still do. Uh, it, if if you got a if you got a problem with what we're saying, by all means, fucking write in. Mm-hmm. We'll talk. I mean, we, we've yeah. been talking with some people back and forth for months. Wesley doesn't yeah. have iTunes at all, and I have to fire up a virtual machine to get to it. Maybe we I'll don't just start, check it frequently. I'll start asking Meredith once more. <laughs> she but she actually it's, runs. Some- it's uh, more reviews bumps us up in the iTunes rankings so people are more likely to find the show so if you like the show that is a way you can directly help more people find us Stitcher is the second biggest place to get podcasts from and we are also uh, underrepresented on Stitcher as a a, a percentage of our our listener base and we have not had any Stitcher reviews this year we still only have that one from last year (laughs) And Stitcher's rankings are based on number of listeners and reviews. So that's another mm-hmm. place where reviewing us, or if you use Stitcher, adding us to your playlist will help us out. I'm going to have to make a little commercial about this, a little blur. I've got a little bit of it in the contact section, but we might need to do a little bit more. 
Uh, I've, I have noticed a number of podcasts reading iTunes reviews on the show. Uh, might have to do that, so give me something to read. <laughs> now, we do have a little bit of, of regular feedback. Okay, what do we got? Uh, regarding episode 119, and the vast majority of this is from Twitter, um, this is from <laughs> at Duck is Lonely, mm-hmm. at Atheist Nomads. Thank you for the mental health podcast that does help. Yeah, hey, fucking A. You're welcome. Regarding episode 123, from at Jinshan Soma. Definitely. Nailed it. Uh, Jaded Zappa. At Atheist Nomads, great interview. From Jason Ford, that's at JCC Ford. Atheist Nomads, that interview was awesome. Yay! And then a little bit later, I'm a bit sad though, my origin story is boring compared to all of you and them. Referring to our, our guests. Yeah. Well, that's a, Jason, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good thing. Uh, regarding episode 124 from Brandon Hertel via YouTube. Mm-hmm. LOL, yay, Mississippi making Idaho look better. <laughs> regarding episode 125, Jason Ford again at JCC Ford. At Angry Black Rant, just listened to your interview on At Atheist Nomads and quite liked it. Thanks for coming on the show. And of course, Ish replied, uh, thanks JCC Ford, and thanks Atheist Nomads for having me on. And we got a few general items as well uh, from Brandon Hertel again, also on YouTube. Is this channel still alive? We have a YouTube channel. And I fell four months behind on getting episodes on there. Oh, shit. I thought that was, I thought that just like went over automatically. It's not automatic. No. And I was doing it a very slow and inefficient way. Hmm. I have since found an easier way where I have a text document with a command. I update the episode numbers, yeah. run it in the terminal, and in about 20 minutes, it generates the episode. Oh, okay. Man, I thought that WordPress just did that automatically. Only if you upload video to WordPress. Gotcha. Which means we would need a lot more storage space. So there was the general yeah. one from uh, Travel Clarky, uh, at Travel Clarky. At Atheist Nomads, do you guys have any suggestions for someone moving to Washington State? I'm trying to decide between Tacoma and Olympia. Uh, as the guy that still lives in this area, yeah. Um, <laughs> I would say by far Tacoma. Uh, it's got a, a nice... Actually, you know, the, the whole town is pretty damn cool. Uh, Olympia can be nice. It can be fairly ghetto, even though it's the capital. Uh, and there's a lot of stinky hippies. I mean, seriously, uh, there's, you know, that the, there's a, a lot of that uh, anti-vax, uh, anti-GMO, all organic kind of thing down down in Olympia. And it's kind of the kind of like a, a new Portland to me. Hmm. Um, yeah, Tacoma's got a, a really nice atheist, uh, secular, skeptic community. Uh, I just really like the area. And um, as somebody who lived in Tacoma, I miss it. Yeah, fucking A. Come on back. It's, if you want to get a hold of us, email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Call us at 541 203 0666. Tweet us at Atheist Nomads or hit us up on Facebook, facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. And please leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, and everywhere else you happen to find the podcast. And the, the holiday push is over. So you know, enjoy your fucking appropriated pagan holiday. And yeah, have a great year. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's, and uh, we'll be back next week with an interview. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads, and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice, and while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.